Hi everyone, this is uh, Dr. Sumit Jain again. So, we will be talking about the remaining questions of subject by test orthopedics. So, let us start from question number 186. So, which says that a 32 years old marathon runner presents with persistent pain over the dorsum of the foot, dorsum of the foot on weight bearing. The most probable diagnosis is. So, marathon runners are those which are subjected to continuous stress over some sort of bones of foot or leg or other part of the body and he is feeling pain over the dorsum of the foot okay, only on weight bearing. Okay. So, what is the diagnosis whether it is Morton's neuroma, plantar fasciitis, March fractures or ATFL sprain. So, let us have a look at these four things. So, if we have a Morton's neuroma, so which usually happens in this area or this area, patient will have symptoms over the these three toes, he will not have symptoms over the dorsum of the foot. And if he has got patient has got plantar fasciitis, usually he will have heel pain or pain over the plantar aspect of the foot. Okay. And if the patient has got March fracture or stress fracture, then he usually will have it over the second or third or fourth metatarsal. So, that pain which is usually over the dorsum of the foot on weight bearing or doing any, any sort of uh, activities. And if a patient has got ATFL sprain, anterior talofibular ligament sprain, he will have pain over the ankle joint, not over the dorsum of the foot. Okay. So, this appears to be a March fracture. Okay. So, so what is March fracture or what is stress fracture? This is a fracture which usually occurs in persons who are either athletes, or dancers or military persons who are subjected to lot of exercise schedule. This occurs in a normal bone which is subjected to heavy and repeated loading. So, this usually happens in all these three categories of persons. So, our our man also 30 year man is athlete. Okay. So, chances of fatigue and stress fracture are more. So, now if you see our normal bone, if you take it trabeculi, it has got different types of cells. It has got osteoclast which resorbs the bone. It has got osteoblast which lead to formation of the new bone. Okay. So, whenever a high load is applied to the bone. So, it will lead to minute defor deformations in the trabeculae. Okay. So, the body will try to repair it with the help of bone resorption which will happen with the help of osteoclasts and bone formation which will happen with the help of osteoblasts. Okay. So, they will repair the bone. Okay. But if that patient is subjected to repeated, repeated and prolonged exposure to the stress and deformation, then the resorption will exceed the replacement. So, that area will become liable to fracture and patient will have a stress fracture. Okay. So, those who are uh, subjected to repeated loading of the bones like military persons, dancers or athletes, they usually have stress fracture. Okay. So, the answer of this question has to be March fracture which is also known as stress fracture. So, the answer is C to 186. Let us move on to question number 187. So, here you can see stress fracture of this bone, here you can see stress fracture of this bone. Okay. So, question number 187, a 25 year old man presents with blue right arm with absent radial pulse. Now, there seems to be some sort of vascular injury, a painful and passive finger extension following the supracondylar fracture of the humerus. He is suffering from pseudex osteodystrophy, median nerve injury, compartment syndrome, myositis ossify. Now, the radial pulse is absent this could be either due to the vascular injury or it could be either due to compartment syndrome. 
Okay. Pseudic osteodystrophy has nothing to do with the absent radial pulse, median nerve injury will also not lead to absent radial pulsation, myositis ossification will lead to restriction of the movement and stiffness of the elbow joint, but not to absent radial pulsation. So, the answer seems to be compartment syndrome. In compartment syndrome, due to increased pressure within the osseofaceous compartment of the bone of the limb. So, the, the capillaries will be compressed first. So, once the capillary will be compressed, the venous outflow will decrease. So, the tissue will swell up. That swelling will further press the tissues within the compartments including nerves and rest of the vessels. So, and whenever that tissue will become ischemic and whenever we try to do a stretching of that tissue, that will be extremely painful. And compression of the uh, arteries is the last sign which you can see in compartment syndrome. So, the 5 P's usually you will see in uh, uh, compartment syndrome is pain out of proportion to the injury. Okay. Then you can see paresthesia, altered sensation, then you can see passive stretch. Okay. And then you can see pulselessness. Okay. So, these P's usually you will see in the compartment syndrome. Okay. So, answer to 187 is C compartment syndrome. The question number 188, a 65 year old man with osteoarthritis complains of back pain, worse on walking along with aching and heaviness in both the legs that forces him to stop walking. Pain is relieved slowly after rest or leaning forward. The most probable diagnosis is. Now, 65 year old man, he already have osteoarthritis okay, and osteoarthritis could involve his spine also. So, when osteoarthritis of the spine will happen, so the size of the canal through which the nerves pass that will become smaller. Okay. Now, rest of the symptom they have described is uh, uh, has aching and heaviness both the legs that could be due to vascular causes as well okay. uh, and which forces him to stop walking. He has to take rest before he further walks. When he bends for bits or takes rest, his symptoms will improve. So, most probable diagnosis is uh, well, uh, this seems to be a neurogenic claudication which usually happens in spinal stenosis. Okay. So, what how will you differentiate neurogenic from the vascular claudication? Basically, in neurogenic claudication, you will have proximal to the distal pain, or in vascular, you will have distal to proximal calf pain. And provocative factors include in neurogenic claudication, pain becomes less on walking up uphill. Okay, because the spine will bend forward, it will go into kyphosis and that will increase the size of the canal. And pain increases due to increased lordosis on downhill walking. So, when the patient will come down, downhill, his spine will go into extension and the diameter of the canal will become less and the symptoms will uh, increase. Whereas, in vascular claudication, pain increases due to increased metabolic demand on uphill walking. So, if a patient has got vascular claudication, uh, he is going upstairs or uphill, his symptoms will going to increase because his muscles need more oxygen and food to work more while going upwards. Okay. Relieving factors, when the patient bends forward, then the pain will be relieved in neurogenic claudication. Whereas, in case of vascular claudication, patient has to sit down uh, or even if he stands for some time, the symptoms will be relieved. Shopping cart sign is basically when we go for the shopping with the help of that trolley kind of uh, thing. So, usually patient neurogenic claudication will uh, keep their elbows over that or forearms and try to bend forward and the symptoms will be relieved. That is called shopping cart sign, which is usually present in neurogenic claudication, but no such sign is present in vascular claudication.
bicycle test means when you are driving a bicycle so you are definitely bending forward okay or and you are sitting so that will relieve the symptoms but in vascular claudication when you are cycling the metabolic demand of the tissue will increase so the leg pain will uh, will be more okay how you can see here on extension the diameter of the canal has become less so if patient goes into lordosis while going downhill his pain will increase and will radiate it down to the leg when the patient sits down and bend forwards you can see the diameter of the canal increases and his symptoms will improve so the answer of this question is going to be spinal stenosis 188 is a so next question is 189 A 74 year old man presents with inability to extend the finger. Okay, he is not able to extend the finger. On examination, his ring finger is locked into flexion. It's locked into flexion, but can be released with manipulation. But slowly, if we keep on trying, we can extend it. Okay. So, what is the most likely diagnosis? Duplex contracture. If you have duplex contracture, which is the uh, contracture of the fascia palmar fascia you cannot extend the finger d curvin stenosynovitis usually happens in the first dorsal compartment it will uh, affect the movements of the thumb not your ring finger rupture of the extensor tendon will can lead to loss of extension of the finger but here after manipulation patient is able to do the extension so it suggests that his extensor tendon is also intact the other option is trigger finger yes that can lock the finger into flexion and if be um, uh, manipulated it, it can uh, it can be released and patient can extend the finger so basically what happens in trigger finger now we have uh, multiple pulleys from a1 to a5 if we see on the volar aspect of our uh, fingers and these pulleys will prevent the bow stringing of the flexor tendons okay now in trigger finger there is a formation of the nodule around this area okay so when we flex it nodule will go will prevent it from flexion once it goes inside this pulley so that will prevent the extension if we manipulate it and we remove we move the uh nodule out of uh, this pulley so patient will be able to extend the finger so there will be nodule or fusiform swelling of the flexor tendon sheath just distal to the pulley so whenever we are releasing that finger so there will be a triggering kind of noise or sound so that's why we call it trigger finger okay now treatment of this kind of uh, uh, issues is basically either it can be resolved by giving a steroid injection into the affected tendon sheath or if it doesn't improve with that then we have to release the a1 pulley so that patient can have smooth gliding movements so the answer to this question 189 is d trigger finger question number 190 A 40-year-old woman presents with eight weeks after a distal radius fracture. Uh, now, 40 years old female, she has got eight weeks now since she has sustained a distal radius fracture with a painful swollen hand. Her hand is painful as well as swollen. The hand is cold, cyanosed, with heightened temperature sensitivity. The likely diagnosis is median nerve injury. Uh, will can lead to uh, temperature heightened temperature sensitivity. Usually, it leads to re reduction in temperature sensitivity. Patient usually have numbness in median of injury. If there is a malunion, it has nothing to do with the temperature sensitivity because his nerves are going to be all right. If we are suspecting compartment syndrome, then if compartment syndrome is there from almost eight weeks since his injury has happened, his hand would have gone into. Uh, gangrene by now so there is another entity called pseudex dystrophy which could lead to all these symptoms let's have a look what is pseudex dystrophy or atrophy this is also known as complex regional pain syndrome or reflex sympathetic dystrophy it usually happens uh, following the injury around the wrist or foot and ankle 
Now, there is a malfunctioning of the peripheral and central nervous system and it can result due to neurogenic inflammation, sensitization due to of the neurons, basomotor dysfunction can be seen in this, this uh, disease or this entity and maladaptive neuroplasticity uh, which happens due, due to uh, pain, uh, the nervous system adapts to the constant pain signal. The clinical features patient will have continuous burning and throbbing pain, he will have increased sensitivity to different stimuli like water, touch and vibrations. So, sweating will be more in the hands, so, you can see the change in colors, there could be bluish or uh, pinkish or reddish discoloration can be seen, you can see the edema, color changes you can see, joints will be tender, he will not be able to make the fist or do, do the full extension of the fingers and edema will be there. Okay. So, this happens due to uh, malfunctioning of the peripheral and central nervous system. So, it can be treated with the help of physiotherapy and drugs, various drugs like anti-inflammatory, sympathetic blockers or sympatholytic drugs could be used. Vitamin C also has been shown to uh, give good results in reflex sympathetic dystrophy. If all these things do not help, we have to give a nerve block okay, to prevent the excessive uh, working of the peripheral nervous system. Okay. So, this situation which they have explained distal radius fracture as we said reflex dystrophy is very common after distal radius fracture, painful swollen hand, cold and cyanosed, increased temperature sensitivity they all point towards pseudex atrophy or dystrophy. So, the answer of question number 190 is C. Okay. Question number 191, which of the following is the most sensitive clinical sign for detection of development dysplasia of the hip in a baby age 6 months. So, 6 months old baby he is talking about. So, various things like Gillesi test yes, asymmetrics unfold yes that we use to uh, diagnose that limited hip abduction inflection is yes autolani, but out of these which is the most common uh, most sensitive test. So, let us have a look Gillesi test now is used uh, to detect the shortening of a limb as compared to the other limb when we bend the knee up to 90 degrees. Now, this test could be positive if patient has got coxavara. Now, this is a normal hip, this is normal hip okay, and this is excessive valgus deformity and this is excessive varus deformity. Now, you can see here if we draw a line over the head. So, in coxavara hip is uh, uh, this limb has become smaller. So, if a patient has got congenital coxabara, okay, so then this Gallizi test could be positive. So, it is quite possible he has got congenital coxabara and not DDH. So, this test could be positive. So, that is why this is not a very sensitive test to diagnose DDH. Asymmetric skin folds, they can be seen even in the normal babies also in 25 percent of the normal babies. So, this is again not a very sensitive test. So, now less than 60 degree of abduction in 90 degree of reflection is the most sensitive clinical test, especially in older child. Here the child is 6 months old and if the child is more than 3 months old, so decreased abduction is the most sensitive test to diagnose. And moreover, uh, <coughs> if suppose a patient has got a <coughs> irreducible dislocation. So, neither your Ortolani test will be positive nor your Barlow test would be positive. Okay. So, in those cases if we try to do the abduction of the limb, so uh, this would be limited. So, limited abduction is the most sensitive test for diagnosing development dysplasia of the hip. So, answer of 191 is C. Next question 192. A 28 year old female presents to your clinic with progressively increasing pain in her left wrist. So, pain bone pain is there. She has 
She also has recently been having repeated episodes of abdominal discomfort, nausea and vomiting. So, she has got bone pain, she has got abdominal groans, okay. a plain radiograph of the wrist reveals a eccentrically placed lytic lesion in the metaphysis and epiphysis with thinning of the cortex. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? Now, from radiological finding, this appears to be giant cell tumor for which we should go for biopsy and all that. But before the radiological findings, they have given two another things. What is one is bone pain, another is abdominal issues. Okay. So, this scenario basically highlights the issues of undiagnosed hyperparathyroidism where due to increased secretion of the uh, parathyroid hormone that will lead to bone resorptions and osteolytic lesions in different parts of the body, okay, which can be mistaken for giant cell tumor. Okay. So, other skeletal effects of hyperthyroidism include massive bone resorption, bone fracture, bone pain, osteopenia and we can have brown tumors as well which is circumscribed light, lytic lesion, which is also known as fibrosa cystica okay, uh, that appears similar to GCT. Other clinical features you will see in hyperparathyroidism are bones, stones, groans and moans. Okay. The patient in this case will have bone pain, bones, so that goes with the bones and he has got gastrointestinal symptoms as well which is which goes with abdominal groans. This should prompt the consideration of hyperthyroidism in such a patient. Okay. If we do a simple blood test uh, looking for uh, serum calcium and parathyroid hormone, so our diagnosis will be confirmed. We do not have to go for unnecessary biopsy in these cases. So, choice A, B and C should not be considered un until a diagnosis has been established. So, the treatment of brown tumor depends upon underlying etiology of the hyperparathyroidism. Okay. So, another slide will uh, give everything in uh, short. So, patient uh, will have bones, stones, groans and moan which is a mnemonics to remember this painful bones will be there. Uh, classically osteitis, fibrosa, cystic or brown tumor can be seen as it is seen in this picture. Renal stones could be there because of hypercalcemia, abdominal groans like GIT symptoms of nausea, vomiting, constipation and indigestion could be there. Psychiatric moans could also be there uh, because of hypercalcemia, patient can have lethargy, fatigue, memory loss, psychosis and depression. Okay. So, the answer of this question is better we do a simple blood test to check serum calcium and parathyroid hormone before we go for any other uh, biopsy. So, the answer to 192 is D. Question number 193, which of the following is a benign tumor that can metastasize to the lung? So, there are only two benign tumors which can metastasize to the lung. One is giant cell tumor, another is chondroblastoma. Okay. So, in here in the choices we do not have giant cell tumors, so the only choice left is chondroblastoma. So, answer to the 193 is D chondroblastoma. Question number 194, which of the following is not, not one of the trabecular patterns in the proximal femur? To answer this question, first of all we must know what are the trabecular patterns in a proximal femur, if we see a proper digital x-ray of the proximal femur, femur you will see five, five types of trabecular patterns. Okay. The two are compressive, two are tensile, one is trochanteric. So, this the vertical one is primary compressive, the other one is other vertical one is secondary compressive, the, the one which is horizontal is principal tensile or primary tensile. 
okay the other horizontal is secondary tensile and third uh, the fifth one is trochanteric group of trabecli we don't have any sort of lesser trochanteric group of trabecular pattern okay so greater trochanteric group yes we have lesser trochanteric group no we don't have principal compressive yes secondary compressive yes so answer which is not the trabecular pattern is lesser trochanteric so b is the answer of question number 194 195 a patient is to have primary total hip replacement and takes methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis so should be stop 24 hours before the surgery should be stop it one week before surgery uh, reduce to half the dose but not stop continue as usual now if you see at the literature they have mentioned that although uh, there are little bit increased chances of infection in patients who have uh, who are on methotrexate but the recent studies have suggested that it usually doesn't make much difference so this uh, grenon at all they have taken two group of patients in one which was on methotrexate where it was continued and another group the methotrexate was stopped so they have seen that the in both the group the chances of infection were similar it was not increased in a group of patient where the methotrexate was given moreover if we stop the methotrexate his disease can flare up so the post operative uh, rehabilitation will be a hampered so that's why it's better to continue the methotrexate as usual so that the rehabilitation will not be an issue so the answer to the question number 195 is d continue it as usual 196 the muscle which causes of avulsion of anterior inferior leg spine basically this is a pure anatomy question so they want to know what is attached to the in anterior inferior leg spine and um, this is nothing what tractus femoris muscle which is attached to the anterior inferior leg spine have a look at this picture now they this is the anterior superior leg spine this is anterior inferior iliac spine so the muscle attached here is rectus femoris so the answer to this question will be b rectus femoris question number 197 which of the following inserts into talus now although uh, plenty of ligaments are attached to the uh, talus and few tendon pass close to the talus but none of the muscle is attached to the talus okay so talus has many ligaments attachment but no muscle attachment so the answer to this question is going to be d none of the above as no muscle is attached to talus so answer is d 198 which of the following best describes a toe deformity where there is hyperextension at the metatarsophalangeal joint, flexion at the proximal and flexion at the distal interphalangeal joints, whether it is a claw toe, hammer toe, mallet toe, curly toe. Let us have a look at all these different types of toes. Now he is saying there is a hyperextension at the metatarsophalangeal joint, metatarsal and phalanx. So, there is a flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint, yes, there is a flexion at the distal interphalangeal joint. There. So, this kind of toe is called claw toe. Now, another toe where there is a hyperextension at the metatarsophalangeal joints and flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joints, but nothing at the distal interphalangeal joint is called hammer toe. A mallet toe will have only flexion at the distal interphalangeal joint okay and the curly toe is usually a congenital condition which is seen in the kids where there will be flexion and medial deviation of the toes so in our case he has got hyperextension here flexion here and flexion here which makes it claw toe so the answer is going to be 
a the claw toe question number 199 what is the most common pathological arthroscopic finding following a traumatic anterior dislocation we all know the most common lesion which we see is the tear of the anterior inferior labrum okay which is also known as bankart's lesion let's have a look at the percentage of different lesions incidence wise 87% of the lesions are anterior inferior glenoid labral tear which is also called bankart lesion 79% is anterior capsular insufficiency then in 68% of the patient will have hill sacks lesion 55% lesions will be glenohumeral ligament insufficiency and 14% will have complete rotator cuff tear 12% will have posterior labral tear and 7% will have superior labral anterior posterior tears so the most common injury will be bankart lesion which is nothing but anterior inferior labral tear so the answer to the question number 199 is d so the question number 200 the last question a 60 year old patient who is suffering from osteoarthritis of the knee is complaining of pain around the shoulder at the end of obduction the most probable pathology is 60 year old patient usually this kind of patient have some sort of osteoarthritis of some some of the joint he has got pain around the shoulder at the end of obduction not throughout the movement not throughout the abduction not in the mid of the abduction but at the end of the abduction so now what it could be let's have a look at the pain during the different movements now if a patient is doing an abduction and he has got pain from 60 to 120 degree of movements that is basically due to the painful arc or subacromial impingement syndrome okay now if the pain is from 45 up to 120 degree that is due to glenohumeral arc now if a patient has got pain in the end of the movements that usually occurs due to acromioclavicular joints okay so here the patient has got pain around the shoulder at the end of abduction which usually involve the acromioclavicular joint to understand it in a better way i would like you to have a look at one of the videos which will explain it in a more better way painful arc test impingement syndrome is one of the most common shoulder conditions as the name suggests a narrowing of the subacromial or sometimes the subcoracoid space causes the acromion to rub against the tendons or bursa The painful arc test is used to identify a possible subacromial impingement. It is positive if pain occurs in or around the glenohumeral joint during active or passive elevation of the arm, specifically within the middle of the arch. Movement is generally painless at the beginning and end of the arc. Ask the patient to raise both arms with extended hands above the head in the form of an arch, which requires full abduction of the shoulders. The arm should also externally rotate slightly. In healthy individuals, this movement should be possible without problems. If pain occurs during elevation, however, the exact location should be determined as it can better assess the cause of pain. Pain during abduction between 60 and 120 degrees is a classical sign for a subacromial impingement. During this motion, The proximal supraspinatus tendon is constricted between the greater tubercle and the acromion, which can irritate the tendon as well as the subacromial bursa and lead to pain. Pain can also occur at an elevation over 120 degrees, which is more suggestive of a condition in the acromioclavicular joint such as osteoarthritis. The pain arises because of increased pressure and torsion within the joint. If pain is present throughout the entire movement, other conditions such as osteoarthritis of the glenohumeral joint or a frozen shoulder should be considered in addition to an impingement syndrome.
thank you that is all uh, this finishes the subject by test orthopedics thanks emilian thank you